117 says, Praise the Lord, all nations. Glorify him, all peoples. For his faithful love to us is great. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Hallelujah. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. And let us praise his name. worship our King Come let us bow at His feet He has done great things See what our Savior has done See how His love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Restore. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things, God. You do. done great things Hallelujah God above it all chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things you have done great things oh god you do
Heavenly Father, that there is for us a place in your house. For you, Father, have made us your sons and daughters, your beloved children. Because of your eternal only begotten son, Jesus. For is that the baptism of your son, Jesus, in the Jordan that you proclaimed him to be your beloved son. That you anointed him with your Holy Spirit. And that he joined himself with us in our sin. So that we might receive his sonship his inheritance. And we pray, Father, that you would make all of us as believers baptized in his name, faithful in our calling as you declare us to be your children, your beloved sons and daughters. Oh, Father, that we would know that we are free in Jesus, free to live as your children with your favor, with your grace as our heavenly Father, in union with Jesus, our Lord and King and Savior, who rules and reigns with you, Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And everyone said, amen. And let us confess our baptismal faith together out loud to one another, to the world, angels and demons, and the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we continue our worship by collecting the tithes and the offerings. If you're a guest with us, feel no obligation to give. We're just delighted that you've joined us uh, this morning. And also, you had received a connection card. Um, you can drop that in the offering basket. Uh, if there's any way we can connect with you, pray for you, or you would like to get to know more about us as a church family, we would love to. Um, give you that opportunity to get to know us. So a few announcements as the offering is being taken. Following this service, we will have our Bible exploration time. Kids Connection uh, will be in the ark. And actually, uh, these students I have, their schedules are all over the place. So I'm teaching confirmation this morning in the ark. And for the adults, I invite you, encourage you to stay. Art Schroeder will be teaching a series on parables. Notice three, parable threes. Three talents, three lost items, three types of soil, three kinds of people. And today's a three talents. So uh, stay and uh, you will be blessed and encouraged in your faith. Next, we're searching for someone with a passion for sound uh, and technology in the booth uh, to volunteer back there. If you're interested and you're like, you know, I think, yeah, that sounds like I, I might be interested in serving in that way. Let Mike know. He's the one that plays guitar right here. See him today. Sound, visuals too or just sound? Okay, we need someone for sound. Also for visuals too. So controlling what you see up here. If you might be interested, you'll get trained. You're like, well, I don't know how to do anything. It's okay. He'll train you. Also, students, listen up. The You Matter Tour with national youth coach and author Heather Roosh, that's how she pronounces it, for Life Sunday. So that's next Sunday, January 20, wait a minute, no, two Sundays, thank you. Yeah, I'm like, don't need to hurry up January. January 23rd, coming up in two weeks. Um, so this will be at Grace Lutheran in Coopersville. From 2 to 5, national speaker promoting and continuing her You Matter tour directed to 
youth. She's been on numerous campuses, public, private schools, as well as churches. She'll be the keynote speaker at the junior high district gathering in June of this year. And she will talk on our identity. What do you know? That's what I'm talking about this morning. Um, Holy Spirit God thing. Uh, How the world twists it and tells the false narrative that they don't matter unless blank, you name it. However, we have an identity rooted in Christ. They matter. So, oh, students, it sounds like, yeah, you need to go. So, see Shannon if you can attend. And finally, something I want to make you aware of that the Michigan District is putting on. It's a theological, biblical conference. This isn't just for pastors. They do ones for just pastors, but this is for all God's people. It's called Beyond the Walls with Jesus. Uh, This will be February 5th in Lansing at um, uh, Christ Our Savior Lutheran Church. And uh, I'll be going. I know, I think one or more have already signed up. I encourage you to sign up. We'll kind of hang out together as a group. And uh, so $15 for students, $20 in general. And uh, you can check it out on their website, michigandistrict.org. And uh, with that said, let's prepare our hearts to hear God's word this morning. And on this first Sunday in Epiphany, I'd like to read from the prophet Isaiah. And is he speaking to God's people who will be in exile? I want you to hear this as if God is speaking to you. Now this is what the Lord says. The one who created you, Jacob. And the one who formed you, Israel. Do not fear. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. The rivers will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, and the flame will not burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, and your Savior. I have given Egypt as a ransom for you, Cush and Seba in your place, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I will give people in exchange for you and nations instead of your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. And I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who bears my name and is created for my glory. I have formed them indeed. I have made them. This is the word of the Lord. And then Paul's words to the Romans in his letter, chapter 6, about how our identity is personally sealed in our baptism. Romans 6, 1 to 11. So what should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved by sin since a person who has died is freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. 
And finally, the narrative from the Gospel of Luke about the baptism of Jesus. People are wondering, well, is John the Messiah? No. Now, the people were waiting expectantly. And all of them were questioning in their hearts whether John might be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I am is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovels in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with fire that never goes out. Then along with many other exhortations, he proclaimed good news to the people. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the evil things he'd done, Herod added this to everything else. He locked up John in prison. And when all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. And as he was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a physical appearance like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please pray with me. Father, we ask that you would speak to us through your word this day. May your Holy Spirit have free course in this place. Work in our hearts, in our lives. Lord, right at our point of need, speak to us. Work in us, renew us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you show me your ID, please? And then you get out your driver's license and hand it to customer service lady at the Allegiant Air desk to confirm your tickets for your flight so they can print out the boarding passes. Whether it's for boarding passes to board a plane or whether it's to buy a new car, or it's at the bank. I mean, there's so many places. Can you show me your ID, please? And you know, whip out your driver's license, and, you know, they look at this. And, of course, when I hand it to them, I'm thinking, please don't look at the picture. I hate this picture. I can't wait to get a new one. It's just, oh. So, you know, nerf side is like, this is really you? Um, you know, and looking at it, and, you know, oh, okay, 6-1. I know some of my kids will now... Um, question that. We don't think he is 6'1". I think that's a lie. Um, but anyway, here's my ID. And, uh, and everywhere we go, we live in this you know, hyper stringent identification society. You know, we have to show our driver's license. Some places you got to give, you know, your birth certificate or your passport or whenever you do transactions, you know, you have to have what's your username, what's your password. I hate passwords for crying out loud. You know, just when I think I got one down, then they want, we need an extra character or something. It's like, well, they just throws it off, and then I don't remember, and I forgot my password, and they have to send it to me again, and I hate that. So everywhere we go, are you who you say you are? Give proof of your identification. You know what's so ironic? We, we live in this culture where, you know, now they're going to be able to scan and track us and all of our movements and everywhere we go. And yet we don't truly know who we are. We, we're struggling with a crisis of identity in our culture. So many people they show their driver's license and yet truth be told, they're like, I don't know who I am. I found a sad story in the BBC, you know, British News. It was an article titled, Former Trans Teenager Wishes Someone Had Challenged Her. Kira Bell is her name. And so when she was 14, she was struggling with who she was, with her identity. And, and she was thinking maybe she identified as a boy. And so two years later, she was prescribed puberty blockers. This is in Britain and testosterone. And then by the age of 20, she underwent a double mastectomy to remove both breasts. And by the time this article was written in 2020, she was 23. Now she had reverted and she identified with her biological sex 
again, as a female, as a girl, a woman. And she won a lawsuit against the doctors who allowed her to go down this path at such a young age. Now, I want to read some of the words from this article. Now, mind you, this is a BBC British news article. It says, at the time, Kira believed that these treatments would help her achieve happiness. Now, I want you to catch that. You know, searching for happiness in who we are, in our identity. And she, she was led to believe this will make you happy. She said, I was stuck in severe depression and anxiety. I felt extremely out of place in the world. I was really struggling with puberty and my sexuality. And I had no one to talk these things through with. And when she sought medical help, she was given the impression that the doctors and therapists would be neutral, but that wasn't the case. She says, once I arrived at the gender identity clinic, that's a thing, I guess in Britain, a gender identity clinic, I was not, now catch this, I was not challenged in any sense, and I was affirmed as a boy from the beginning. Like, well, yeah, but that's just who you are. It, you know, you just got to recreate your, create your identity. And when I was questioning my identity, she says in this article, there was nowhere to find support that didn't affirm, her words, the delusion of being in the wrong body. No organizations existed that might be able to tell me that it was okay to be a girl who didn't like stereotypically girly things. And that I was no less female for it. Kira began questioning the ideology behind her transition when she found herself upset about the case of Rachel Dolezal may have heard that name, a white college professor who identified as black. So I couldn't come up with a reason why being transgender was, quote, more valid than transracial. It was the start of a slow wake-up call, she says. I had finished my physical transition and my health was beginning to decline. It was at the point I realized I didn't want to live a lie. Once again, her words in the BBC. I didn't want to live a lie and that it was really important to be myself. And so she looks back, the writer writing here, she looks back on her transition with sadness. Her treatments have left her with permanent facial hair and a lower voice. Quote, there was nothing wrong with my body. I was just lost and without proper support. I should have been challenged. Right there, highlight that. I should have been challenged on the proposals or the claims that I was making for myself. So she's saying, I was believing lies and someone should have challenged me. And I think that would have made a big difference as well. If I was just challenged on those things I was saying. In December 2020, a British court ruled in Kira Bell's favor that teenagers under 16 are unable to give informed consent about puberty blockers and that it may be necessary even for older teenagers to require the court's decision prescribing these treatments. Oh, there's a whole mess right there. But hear the cry of her heart. If someone had just challenged me in the delusion that I was believing. And we're awash today in a crisis of identity. You know, in a culture where you got to show your ID. And it's like the whole foundation has crumbled. And it's like this black void. And people, it's like, who am I? Why am I here? You know, what's my gender? What's my sexuality? What's my purpose? Why am I here? And in this, this is a spiritual battle for our souls that we're facing. There are two competing positions, two competing truth claims. And on the one side, it says that, our nature, our identity is given to us by God. It's objectively given to us by God apart from anything we do. The other truth claim is that our fundamental core identity is something we construct on our own. And this deals with our core fundamental identity. And yes, you know, the things you do in life, the experiences you have, it will color and shape who you are. But 
your core fundamental identity. What determines that? Is it given to us by God? Or is it something we construct based on what we feel, what we experience, what we desire, what other people tell us? That's the battle. You know, and for us as believers, followers of Jesus, for us to be renewed in where our core essential identity is. And if I can put forth any challenge this morning, it would be challenge all who are followers of Jesus and those who don't yet know him yet to know where our true core essential identity is. It's not something we craft, create, and make up on our own, but it's something given to us by God and that our identity is found in Christ. It's what he has given to us, what he reveals and shows in Christ. And here in this text, in the baptism of Jesus, this is just a power-packed, highly significant text. You know, we, you know, we think of the big events as, you know, Christmas, the birth of Jesus and his transfiguration, suffering, death, resurrection, ascension, pouring out the Holy Spirit coming again. But the baptism of Jesus ranks right up there because it's like who God is and who we are and what he's done is all wrapped up right here in the baptism of Jesus. And when we talk about epiphany, the revelation, the, the revealing of the glory of who God is, it's right here. And the revealing of who we are, it's right here. To know who we are, it begins with knowing who God is. To see God's identity revealed in Christ's baptism and what he has done for you. It begins with seeing who God is as the creator. That there is a God. There is a creator who's made everything. And you see that in his baptism. Now Luke, we got the birth narrative. We saw him as a 12-year-old boy. Lost in Jerusalem. And now we see him at 30 years of age. His cousin, John the Baptist, is preparing people for the Messiah, baptizing people in the Jordan River, saying, he's coming, he's coming. People are like, are you the Messiah? And he's like, no, no, it's not me. He's coming. And while he's baptizing, and, and we have this account in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John alludes to his baptism. And so they all mention it from like a different facet, a little different perspective. Um, Matthew has a little more narrative to it. But here it's really brief, but packed with a lot of meaning. So John is baptizing people, and while they're all baptized, they're coming to confess their sin, to repent, to acknowledge how much they need God and his grace and the forgiveness of that coming Messiah. And so to seal that, he baptizes them. He immerses them in the Jordan River. And while he's baptizing all these Jews who are confessing their sin, so he's baptizing sinners. In this whole line of sinners that he's baptizing, all of a sudden Jesus shows up. And when all the people were baptized, it's like Jesus slipped in the sinner line. He got baptized too. Now, Luke adds this detail. So after he, gets, he is plunged down in the water, and after he comes up out of the water, Luke adds this detail. It was as he was praying that heaven opened. And that is a picture of God revealing the glory of who he, who he is. In Ezekiel chapter 1, when Ezekiel received a vision of God, it says, And I saw heaven open. That's God revealing who he is. Or the prophet Isaiah, when he says, oh, that God would tear apart the heavens and come down. You know, that language of heaven opening. God is revealing himself and also how he is coming to intervene in our lives. So this heaven was open. 
man, what does that look like? Did the clouds just part and all of a sudden this shining light started to appear? I don't know. As in the Holy Spirit descended on him, on Jesus, in a physical appearance like a dove. And so here we have Jesus in the water and the Holy Spirit of God like a dove fluttering down, landing on him. And this recalls a dove over waters, recalls creation. When God in the beginning, Genesis 1-1, created the heavens and the earth, and then the Spirit of God was hovering, it, it's picturing a bird over the waters ready to create. What's the next time that you see a dove? The ark, that's right. You know, and because of evil, God's like, I'm going to hit the reset button and cleanse the filth and evil. And, and finally, no one in his family, you know, they're like, okay, is there any land yet? Is the water receded yet? And so at one point when he sends a dove out and it comes back with an olive branch in its beak, it's a sign, now there's peace. The flood of judgment is over there's land. It's a new creation. It's a reset for creation. And so right here, God is opening the heavens. The spirit who reveals God is revealing who God is and what he's going to do for us. As broken, sinful, self-centered people who are prone to create our own identities, our own realities, to find our significance in what we do, what we experience, what we achieve, what we have. The Holy Spirit descends on Jesus in a physical appearance, and now you have a voice from heaven. The parted clouds, the light of glory, however it looked. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And here we have the epiphany. The Western church starts with the wise men and the star. The Eastern church says, it's right here. I, I'm kind of with the Eastern church. It's right here. God reveals who he is. God is not some impersonal force. Use the force, Luke. You know, like some energy field that pervades all things and you tap into it. Or some, you know, aloof grandfather figure way off in the Andromeda galaxy who could care less about your life. Or some Zeus on Mount Olympus, you know, hurling lightning bolts if you just do the wrong thing. Who is God? You are my beloved son. He is a heavenly father who loves who loves his son. And that Jesus is the son of the father. The eternal son of the father. Loved by the father. And sharing in the outpoured spirit. And that the father loves his son. In the outpoured spirit. And says with you I am well pleased. He's a God who loves, who gives life. He is one God in three persons, a father who loves his eternal son, his word, his wisdom in the outpoured spirit, a father who loves in the outpoured spirit, who spoke his word in the beginning and created the heavens and the earth, a father who loves his son in the outpoured spirit and now speaks his word to recreate us. Because the Father's Son, His only begotten Son from eternity past, has now come down from heaven. The heavens have been parted, and He's come down to us and taken on our flesh and blood. So the wonder of Christmas. You know, Christmas is how God became man and here we're seeing the revelation. This man is truly God. The son of God. This is who he is. We get here the revelation of the triune God in Jesus. That God is a loving father who gives life in Jesus by the spirit. Who he is and what has he done for us? Well this is alluded to in the words with you I am well pleased. 
that Jesus, as the eternal Son of the Father, picking up words from Isaiah, has come to rescue us, has come to save us, because he is identifying with us as sinners. He has come down to the lowest point. So here he is in a baptism for sinners. The sinless son of God who steps into this water. Who steps in our place to take that on himself. I want you to imagine if I gave you each a blank name tag. My name is. And I, I want you right now to think of like the worst, most awful sin, guilt shame, whatever in your life that you would say you struggle with to this day. I mean, what is it? And I want you to imagine that you write that down on that name tag. It could be bitterness. It could be anger because of a, a tragic hurt in the past. It could be a covetous heart. It could be adultery. It could be drunkenness. You know, whatever it is, I want you to imagine what that is. That sin, that guilt, that shame, that failure. And, and, and to you, it's like, it, it's, it's awful. It's in your life. And it's like it defines who you are. It hounds you. It enslaves you. And I want you to imagine that you're right, you write that down. Hi, my name is anger. Hi, my name is bitterness. Hi, my name is greed. Now, if you can imagine that we can do a time warp. And then we can actually step back into time to when Jesus is being baptized. And I want you to imagine that you're going up to Jesus before he goes down under. Take your name tag. Hi, my name is Anger. And he says, put it on you. Put it on me. Slap it on him. Everyone slaps that on him. Hi, my name is Anger. My name is Adultery. My name is Bitterness. My name is Greed. And you slap that on Jesus, on him, that he, in being baptized, this is who God is, that he pours himself out in his son, comes into a baptism for sinner to take all of our guilt, all of our shame, all of our sin, all of our self-created identities that torment us, that don't fulfill us, that don't satisfy us, on himself. So that when he goes under, it's a picture of what he will do at the cross. He will later say, I will undergo a baptism of fire. When he goes to the cross, he will take the judgment of God, the fire of God, that we deserve for our sin, for turning away from God. He will take all that crud, that filth, that darkness, that sin, that evil, that injustice, the shame and the guilt. And bearing all that, all the name tags on him. And he takes that to the cross and he's plunged into our death. And he puts it all to death. He cancels it all. It's like the erase button is hit. Greed, anger, bitterness. Gone. Dead. Paid for. Forgiven. So that when he comes up out of the waters, praying, communing with his heavenly father, he then hears the words, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. So that those words spoken over Jesus may be spoken over you and me. That that would be our identity that we share in him. That he gives to us. But it begins with seeing in Jesus, in his baptism, who God is and what he's done for us. And that then we see our identity revealed as believers in our baptism. Into Christ, by faith. That what he's done, what's pictured here. He wraps us in. And you know, it begins with hearing the good news and coming to believe. And, and for believers to be baptized. And, and for us as baptized believers, this is a reminder of our identity being joined to Jesus. For those, if anyone hasn't been baptized and you trust in Christ, this is an invitation to come and be baptized. And I would encourage you to let me know. It's like, I haven't been baptized. 
You know, Paul says in Galatians 4, through faith you are all sons of God. It should be sons. You're all sons of God in Christ Jesus. That includes women and daughters, but it's like his sonship, that relationship with the Father. By faith, we receive that. When we see it in Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us and put our trust in him, our significance, our identity, our joy, our peace, our happiness is found in him. We receive that, and when we're baptized, if it was as a child, as a teenager, as an adult, or yet to be baptized... It's like he seals that. Notice Paul's words here. For those of you who are baptized into Christ Jesus have been clothed with Christ. For those who believe, when you are baptized, it's like he clothes you with the identity of Jesus. That's who you are. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female. Yeah, biologically, yes, but Your identity does not depend on any of these externals. It does not depend on what you do, on what you experience, on what you feel, you know, on how beautiful you look or not, or how tall or how short. It's found in Christ. Since you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed. That means heirs of the blessing Heirs according to the promise. And that means the words that God spoke over Jesus are spoken over you. You see, when you were baptized, I believe it was like Sunday, July 17th for me, 1970. It's not just, you know, an empty ceremony that points to something going on somewhere else. He puts his name on us. He marks us. He claims us. He's giving us a new identity. Now, that's objectively, personally given. And faith has to receive that. Faith's on the receiving end. To receive that, to experience that, to grow in that. But he did a once-for-all identity marker where he claimed you. It's like he wrote his name on you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that as baptized believers, the Father speaks to you. You are my beloved sons and daughters. The Heavenly Father says, I love you. As my children, for whom I gave my son. And I am pleased with you. And you know what? We need to just receive that. Because so often, you know, our sense of identity and significance is based on, well, how well did I perform? And, you know, for me growing up, how good were my grades? Or, you know, how well, you know, how good do I look? Or, you know, or how am I feeling? And what are other people telling me? No, it's the Father saying, I'm pleased with you. I delight in you. You are precious in my sight. You are my son. You are my daughter in union with Jesus. Let that wash over you. Oh, that's the identity we need to bathe in. That is where our significance is at. That frees us from being enslaved to, you know, everything the culture would pressure us to, social media, experience and feelings that come and go, to just hear these words. You're my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter. And I'm pleased with you. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can do that would make him love you less. Bask in that. So seeing who God is, seeing who we are in Christ, and finally, it's about living in this. The whole battle that we face, when we, the moment we get up in the morning, you know, and, you know, the notifications start pinging on our phone, we get in the shower, we eat, we go to work or school or whatever it is. What's going to define who we are? What's going to drive how we live? What's going to determine and form and shape how we think, the words we speak, how we relate to other people? It's going to be our identity. 
And so that means every single day, daily, live out of your baptismal identity in Christ. You're dead to sin. That old self-seeking, identity-creating, sinful person's dead. Buried. And you have a new spiritual life as a beloved child of the Heavenly Father. So Paul is like, you know, this is the reality. Your old self has died. It was crucified with Jesus. When he died, you died. And when you believe, you receive that, and it was sealed in your baptism, that reality, oh, yep, that was my burial. Dead, done, gone. So that the body ruled by sin, this this self-identity-creating person in rebellion with God, done away with might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is freed from sin. You're free. You're free from having your identity being determined by anything external to you, by any of your feelings, by anything inside of you. It's determined by what God says you are. So Paul ends with this. So you too Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's an everyday renewal, baptismal renewal. God, thank you for making me your own. Thank you for putting your name on me. Let me be dead to sin. I am dead. I'm alive in you. And you know, that's one of the greatest joys of ministry is when I have people come to me and they're they're struggling with guilt. They're struggling with shame or, or, or thinking, you know, the enemy is poured on a sense of condemnation on them that they're like, they're no good. They don't matter. They don't count. And when I can speak the words of identity in Jesus and say, no, you're free of all that. You're forgiven. You are a beloved child of the Heavenly Father, and he's pleased with you. And sometimes people struggle, like, no, that can't be. No, no, there's something I have to do to, to, for him to be ple-. No, he's pleased with you. That's the most joyful aspect of ministry, when someone is, like, resurrected from the dead in hearing who they are in Christ. And I want to leave you with these words personalized from the prophet Isaiah. Now this is what the Lord says. The one who created you. The one who formed you. Don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And the rivers will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched. And the flame will not burn you. I am the Lord your God. The Holy One of Israel. Your Savior. I have given my son as a ransom for you. Because you are precious in my sight and honored. And I love you. I gave my son in exchange for you. And his life instead of your life. Do not fear. For I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. Receive that this day. Bask in the identity that God gives you, that you are who he says you are. Amen? And be free in that identity in the name of Jesus. Please stand. As we with joy, like Jesus, communing with his Father after being baptized, let us pray and bring all of our cares, our needs, our thanksgivings to the Father. Let us bow our heads and let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, you have accomplished our rescue in the baptism of your beloved Son, on his way to the cross and his resurrection for us. Whereby you took all the the sin, the guilt, the shame, the evil, and death itself from us. 
to give us your righteousness, your holiness, your favor, your grace, the inheritance of your eternal son, Jesus, that it would be ours by faith. And as you have baptized us as believers in union with Jesus, may we live in that union life, sharing in the inheritance and identity of your son, Jesus, to know that you, our creator God, are a loving father, that you care for us, you provide for us, that you will bring us safely through this world with all of the turmoil and heartache when we face loss and death, To know that you will bring us through to everlasting life. Renew us each day in our baptismal identity in Christ Jesus. And as you open heaven, Lord, on that day of Christ's baptism, that you would open heaven's gates and doors for your church, for your people, that we would receive that epiphany of your glory in Christ through his word, through the sacraments, through baptism, the Lord's Supper, and as we commune with you in prayer, that we would live as your people, as you, Jesus, are the light of the world, that you would shine your light in our lives and that you would shine through us to those around us lost in the darkness. Oh, Lord, that you would draw all people to yourself from all nations so that as the vision and revelation gives us that hope that people from every tribe, tongue, and nation will be brought to know you. Lord, that you would be at work through your church, through your people, through missionaries, teachers, pastors, servants of your church, that the gospel would go out, that people would be set free to know their identity in Christ. And Lord, we pray that you preserve our families. We pray that you strengthen our marriages. We pray for our homes. Lord, that you would turn husbands and wives toward one another in love. That you would equip fathers and mothers to do their holy duty as teachers of the faith. To preserve their children. To love them with your love. And oh Lord, we pray that you would break the powers of darkness that you would guard and protect our children and our students from the powers of darkness who would seek to lead them astray from their true identity in you, who would seek to deceive them. And we pray for the truth that will set our students, our young people free. Help us, Lord, to challenge one another, to challenge those who are struggling in the darkness with their identity, to find who they are in you. And Heavenly Father, your Son, Jesus, came to rescue, to heal, to save. And we pray that you would come and be present for each and every one of us at our point of need. And, oh, Lord, we pray those who are struggling with sickness and with COVID, with the flu, with cancer, Lord, we pray that you would meet them as their healer, as their great physician, as their good shepherd. That according to your will, you grant healing and strength. Lord, those who grieve the loss of loved ones, oh, Lord, we lift them up to you. We pray that you would comfort them in the valley of the shadow of death. And, Lord, we lift up Sherry Miller and her family as she mourns the passing of her mom, Ruth Cooper. And, Lord, for others in our midst, Lord, who are maybe grieving the loss of loved ones, Lord, we pray that you be their comfort and peace. And Lord, for Vicki Abbott and her family as they mourn the passing of her mom. And Lord, be with Paul Goosen as he recovers from heart surgery, that you would strengthen, heal, and give him a good, speedy recovery. Lord, these and all other petitions and needs in our midst we offer up to you. And Lord, give us the eyes of faith to see the glory of who you are in Jesus, what our true identity is that we would find our true joy and peace in you and that you would ground our lives in the hope of your everlasting kingdom to come. As you have taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be magnified were the whole earth echoing His name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We'd hear Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified. Let his 
your Lord Jesus Christ, the overflowing love of your heavenly Father, and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit strengthen and be and abide with you always that you may live in the embrace and the covering of Jesus by whom you know you're a beloved child of the Heavenly Father. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Love on one another as a Jesus-looking people. See you back here, adults, in about 10 minutes for the Bible exploration. Kids, your class, confirmation as well. Blessing. Have a good week.